welcome to episode 162 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I am here with... Andrew Swafford. Jessica Carr. And Darren Hughes. And in today's episode, we will be doing our usual movies we saw this week in part one. And in part two, as you heard two seconds ago, Darren Hughes has joined us. He's fresh from Toronto, ready to report on what's happening at the Toronto International Film Festival and tell us what we should be excited for. Uh... For maybe not in the next year, but in the next, or, or for the rest of the year, but in the next year or two, in that, in that, there's a, there's a broader range. Is that true? Six months. Yeah. All right. I, I, I figured it's not like some, some <laughs> yeah, of the stuff so. is not stuff we'll be seeing later this year. I just didn't, I just didn't explain it very well. Um, all right. Well, we, uh, we're going to start out first with not one, but two listener email letters whatever you would like to call them uh andrew you have yeah andrew you have one that's a little bit longer so much feedback um, in the last so couple why weeks. don't you read the excerpt that you have from it yeah Whew. okay so we have a pot uh, we have a comment on the podcast page on cinematary.com Uh, on the the episode we put out last week about how we define film in relation to television. Uh, This comment was left uh, by a friend of mine named Michael, who I work with. He is also an English teacher, and so he is very long-winded. So his comment is super long. I have cut it down uh, to less than half of its original length, but uh, it is still very long. So bear with me while I read through this thing, and we can get reactions from y'all and then move on to our second letter. So here we go. Uh, Michael's letter. Hi, Cinematary. A few thoughts about your part two topic. When it comes down to it, I'd say the actual difference between TV and cinema has to do with the various ways that each create meaning. Although both TV and cinema share basically identical features in creating their works, plot, actors, screenplays, sets, shots, cuts, etc., the way that each medium uses some of these features differs significantly. Historically, cinema has been a very visual-centric medium, and so the way that cinema typically creates meaning is through the manipulation of visual pieces, how a shot is crafted, where the cuts occur, how the actors are framed within a shot in relationship to one another. As for television, this has historically been a much more writer-centric medium, so the pieces of it tend to manipulate Uh, The pieces of it tends to manipulate to create meaningful experiences are writerly. Uh, The long-form development of characters, the rapid interplay of character dialogue, the progression of plot. Um, That's not to say that writing is not important in cinema or that visuals aren't important in television, just that each one emphasizes different parts of the motion picture vocabulary. A quote-unquote good movie will be one that presents something in a visually exciting or engaging way, while a quote-unquote good television series is one that does exciting or engaging things with its plot and characters. This is, of course, grossly simplifying things, but I do think it's an idea that's generally applicable. Uh, Of course, uh, both television and mainstream film are both narrative art forms, so I'm not saying that movies never tell stories, but the specific ways that movies tell stories feel different than the ways television does, and it's not just the way that movies rely on visual storytelling, although that's a big part of it. Movie storytelling is based on change. A character or situation at the beginning of a film will morph, and once that change has occurred, the story has been told. Television, on the other hand, is a medium whose storytelling takes shape from a tension between change and stasis. Traditionally, this is most clearly manifested in the most basic television storytelling unit, the episode, a unit cinema lacks unless it creates it artificially within its official unit of the feature film. A television show has a premise, and each episode represents a new permutation on that premise that shakes up the stasis of the show's premise. The storytelling within the episode will represent an attempt to return to that stasis. Sometimes this return forms a complete circle, and the next episode starts from the exact same place as the previous one. Other times, this return is not always completely successful. The characters are unable to resolve the changes that have shaken the stasis, and with each episode, there's a growing tension of just how far the show can move from its premise before snapping back to its original point or simply breaking its narrative. This is rarely a question in film, where the emphasis is more on how things change rather than whether they will or not. And he gives us a P.S. For the record, I think Twin Peaks The Return is definitely television. Uh, If nothing else, it's very carefully structured episodically, which is not something you see in most movies and certainly not Lynch movies. Anyway, keep on keeping on, Michael. So, after that very long but very insightful and well-worded letter, um, thoughts from you guys about that? Yeah, Michael should have been on the podcast last week. (laughs) 
He, he basically is this week. <laughs> he, should, he should have been in the middle of that discussion. Um, I, I would maybe like to have him on eventually. Um, but yeah, go ahead, Darren. I was just going to say I was with him until the the very last PS, which um, based on his description, I would say Twin Peaks: The Return was a long movie. I do not think that it is structured episodically either. Um, like there's no single arc in any particular episode. They will drop little plot threads that get picked up three or four episodes later on. Uh, th- th- there's no concise or cohesiveness, conciseness or cohesiveness to any individual episode of the return, which is why I tend to see it as a film as well. Yeah, uh, I agree. I, actually, I, I, um, on the commute home from work today, I was listening to a uh, film comment just, posted Same, a podcast did you listen to that yes yeah it's really good um dennis Lim is a, is a great critic of of david lynch and and he talks he talks about that talks about how like um you know this 18 18 hour arc uh gave lynch an opportunity to play with duration in ways yeah. that um i don't think we've ever seen on tv and to me, it does feel like that long arc is structured in a very similar way to other Lynch movies, especially Mulholland Drive. Uh, like in Mulholland Drive, it takes maybe 30 or 45 minutes before you start to see recurring characters. You're just cycling through random characters you don't really know. And then after you get to that 30 minute mark, you start to see how they overlap. The same basic structure follows through all of the return where, you know, the first four or five episodes feel completely disjointed from one another until things start to cohere in the middle of the series. So it does feel to me like a long form Lynch film rather than Lynch doing television. Um, But I think that all of Michael's thoughts about like um, the emphasis on visuals in movies and the emphasis on plot and change uh, in television is totally spot on and and something that, uh, we should have touched on in that episode, but I'm glad that we didn't so that he could have written us that awesome letter. If you want to read Michael's full thoughts, it is on the comment thread at the bottom. If you go to cinematary.com and click on the most recent episode, episode 161, uh, you can find it at the bottom there and read the full thing. Um, but yeah, I agree. My favorite part I had to cut, uh, which was when he talks for a minute about video game cutscenes and how they fail to actually be cinematic or fail to do what cinema does well. <laughs> um, so I'm yeah, sure, go check out uh, the I'm full sure thing. listener David Allen would appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> that diverge into uh, <laughs> into video game cutscenes, especially if Nathan did it. Um, but go. yeah, thank you, thank you, Michael. Uh, our <laughs> next letter is uh, from longtime fan that Ron. Which let me let's make sure we emphasize longtime <laughs> fan because if we criticize him at any point during this letter or afterwards, he's gonna be <laughs> he's gonna he's cite gonna the cite the fact that he's a longtime fan. fan and get his feelings hurt. So let's just up front say that. Um, Though I think David Allen is maybe a a longer time. I agree fan. too, David. Shout out to you. I re- we appreciate your your. You're your awesome. Thing. Thank you. Um, all right. So he says, "Dear Cinematarians, I thoroughly enjoyed your stimulating discussion on episode 161. Is it film or a TV show?" Andrew Swafford presented his thesis succinctly. I got it. And the comments from Lydia and Nathan <laughs> were insightful and articulate. I'm especially amused to learn that the, those TV series cliffhangers designed to intrigue Miss Creech into next week's episode leave her merely frustrated and unintrigued. And Zach's effort to remain civil while expressing his deep skepticism of the whole subject was delightfully Zach-like. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As listened, as I listened, though, a thought struck me that perhaps provides a bit of historically provocative context. Charles Dickens' David Copperfield was originally published in the magazine Household Words as monthly installments from May 1849 to November 1850, when the full text was then published in book form for the first time. His 13th novel, Great Expectations, was published weekly in the magazine all the year round between December 1860 and August 1861, and only then as a book. In fact, most of Dickens' classic works entered the world as magazine magazine serials. I like to imagine eager Victorians rushing out to binge read when they finally appeared as books. And so I ask you, was Charles Dickens a film or just a TV show? Longtime fan, that wrong. <laughs> and let me first say about that question, no, he's uh, a human being. He's not either. But let's go. Let's go, I understand what he's asking. <laughs> so I guess to, to you all, yeah. I will, I will get to that question in a second. I would first like to thank Ron for his historically provocative context, which is probably my favorite type of context. Um, but I will, I will also say that 
Uh, like I said on last week's podcast, I'm very much in the same camp as Lydia in that episodic television and the cliffhangers, the artificially constructed cliffhangers, um, get on my nerves more than they engage me and 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 make me compel me to continue watching the show, uh, which is probably part of the reason why I'm not a huge Charles Dickens fan either. Because I think Ron is 100% correct that there's a, a huge overlap between the the Victorian period of literature where a lot of books were being written in serial format and authors are being paid by the word and things like that and they were just finding ways to keep the story going you can kind of see my negative slant on Charles Dickens and other Victorian writers right now but uh I think there is a lot of overlap between that and television. And I was also thinking in last week's episode about how there, there's overlap between the television format and the medium of comic books, uh, which is just kind of a self-perpetuating thing. There's never an end point in sight for the most part in comics, unless it's a very short run. The idea is just to kind of keep these characters going and, and, and keep uh, them in the public consciousness, I guess, which is why I don't understand why Marvel movies are movies. They really are better suited for the medium of television and why I think the like the cinematic universe movies don't actually feel like movies at all uh, and I made that point in last week's podcast so yeah Charles Dickens serial TV and Marvel movies slash comic books I feel like all have a certain kinship with one another no all right no, I can't I, I, I can't I guess I you know I'll add that at least with TV shows, I agree with Marvel Comics, but TV shows definitely do have a beginning and end point, unless it's like The Simpsons or something where it just goes on forever. Um, yeah, I, I yeah, think, yeah. And, I, like, and I, I think, think when I think when I really go ahead. Me? Oh, okay. I, I was gonna say I really do respect when TV shows begin with a specific end point in mind, um, like we talked last week about True Detective and that intended to be be eight episodes and then of course it gets ruined because it's a popular thing and they have to continue it um but of course there's always going to be a spectrum of ways in which these stories are structured even if you are in tv what were you about to say zach uh no nothing (laughs) it's gone now (laughs) it's gone now that's delightfully Um, zach like of you it's delightfully Zach like, yeah. yeah. That's 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 my freaking bumper sticker. Um, thank you, Ron, <laughs> uh, for your letter, uh, and Michael. We we appreciate both of them. Uh, let's go ahead and get into movies that we saw this week. The first one I'm gonna go ahead and do before we get into the bigger re- release, um, and that that one is the trip to Spain. I caught this. Uh, it was playing for probably just a week here, um, and. I'm a big fan. I love the the first two entries, um, the trip and the trip to Italy, uh, which I both uh, rewatched both of them before I went and saw this one. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the trip series, uh, the first one it it stars uh, Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon, and they play these kind of fictionalized versions of themselves. Uh, uh, Coogan is generally much more um, pedantic and and self-involved and you know curious what you know what's his next big move um while bryden it, it has more of a family life he has a, you know a wife and in, into in a kid back home and uh is lives and dies on his impressions of various uh, famous british people including uh michael kane and and mick jagger and uh and Roger Moore, the last two, especially for this last one. If you've seen the first two movies, they, they really lean on Michael Caine, but this one, they have like a extended scene of just them doing Roger Moore and uh, Mick Jagger. Um, but yeah, the, the the first one they are going through the north of England, and the premise is that uh, you know some a magazine in Britain wants Steve Coogan to drive through um, the north of England and stop at these various restaurants uh, and write about it. And he wants to go with his girlfriend, but his girlfriend can't go, so he takes Rob Brydon. Uh, and you know, of course, hijinks ensue. They they they're these friends who have known each other for I think in the first movie it's up to like 11, 13 years, uh, and so they it's one of those they know exactly the buttons that they can push on each other and and make each other mad 
And they do that over the course of two hours. Uh, the second one takes place in, you know, same premise, but in Italy. And this third one, again, same premise, but in Spain. Um, I, I was thinking, you know, it's it's one of those, the, the not much changes in the formula of these movies. You know, the trip to Spain is, exa- you know, exactly the same in terms of how it's constructed uh, to, to the trip and the trip to Italy. But I think um, I think that the, the, the what works about this series is that it, it's able to to one lets you kind of progress with these characters as you know series of movies do but also it, it you know i think that coming in with a simu- similar formula and kind of revisiting the same mold allows you to really focus in onto the small finer points that you know that these characters are dealing with and at least on this most recent rewatch i've seen this is probably the third time that i've seen the trip the second time i've seen the trip to italy um second or third time but i re- i realized how incredibly sad these movies are especially the first one the first one is an insanely sad movie it ends with you know bryden going home to his family you know and being greeted by his wife and kid and and all happy and then coogan going home to this very quiet desolate you know lonely apartment his girlfriend is off in america and is unable to come and visit him his son is you know he talks to over the the phone a couple times but doesn't see him and it kind of just ends with the scene of him getting home and looking out the window you know kind of quietly and then it just ends and it's i was i was that one really struck me the second one is a little bit at least um it kind of explores more on the rob bryden side you know he this time around he kind of has a fling with a woman while he's off you know uh in italy with with steve and is kind of reflecting in 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 thinking about his life at this point in time he has you know his his wife's there with their daughter and then i think i i you know another baby is on the way and you can tell that he um is you know kind of dealing with you you know that change in in how his life is and so this third one is is interesting it's funny coogan uh at this point there's a lot of a lot of references to philomena which he was nominated for an oscar for he likes to make it abundantly clear that he's on a first name basis with dame judy uh, judy dench um but again it's it's about you know I don't know. I, I, you know, maybe maybe this is an eye roll for for most people, but it's these two, you know, middle aged men who are kind of coping with, um, you know, where you know what the what this this next part of their life is. Um, I think it's I think it's a very astute observation to make that they you know make these impressions of these these you know big figures you know Mike like again like I said Michael Caine Mick Jagger Roger Moore um, and you know I think uh, uh, Rob Brydon also does uh, you know Woody Allen on occasion. And it's these it's these figures that are men that are are much more well known and greater than they are. Coogan's character is constantly looking for some sort of career validation. Over the course of this movie, he's trying to uh, end. He's trying to get this his follow up to Philomena made, and it keeps getting kind of skirted away by the uh, by the studio. While Bryden is getting offers to do more stuff in America, and you never have a moment where they sit down and actually have like a very deep in depth, um, you know, connecting conversation. It seems like every time, and this goes on over the course of the series, every time they want to have an actual, you know, serious talk about something, there's some sort of impression in the, you know, there's, there's an impasse in between the two of them while they're trying to have this moment, which I think is indicative of most male friendships. You know, you, it's, it's difficult to connect as, you know, and, and be able to have actual emotions with, you know, to each other when, and it's much easier to filter that through some, you know, something, whether it's an impression or something else. Uh, and I think that this series really hits that poignantly. Um, I don't know if you've never seen the trip movies, the, the, the first. Is there delicious food in the movie? No, they, they, it's it's all really gross food. It, it's kind of unappealing, honestly. 
no that's my favorite part about <laughs> no. those movies because the food looks so good no there's 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 some good I, and i honestly earned some <laughs> i there's no there's some good food in this one I, and i earned some appreciation i don't know what i thought spain looked like but i really spain look there's a lot of hills and lots of castles and stuff it's it's kind of cool i kind of want to go to spain now um but yeah if you've never seen the first two trip movies and you want to see some some you know good food they are uh the, the first two are on netflix and if you can catch the trip to spain in theaters i recommend it i think that it's a it's a great series and it's one that i hope they keep doing every couple you know every three four years because it's kind of fun to revisit that plus uh, it's just it's the, the impressions you know what's coming but they're really funny they're <laughs> They do a good job. Uh, they probably will keep doing them because it's kind of a TV show. Yeah, it is. I'd like to watch the TV show and see, if, you know, <laughs> and kind of figure out the yeah, parts I, that are kind of too. taken out. But, um, yeah, the trip to Spain. Uh, the other movie we wanted to talk about, uh, and we probably will get a little extended on, is Mother, the recent release by Darren Aronofsky. Uh, he wrote and directed this. It stars Jennifer Lawrence and Javier Bardem. And no, um, it is not in any way connected to arrest development it is actually a psychological thriller uh i think the best way to describe it is that um jennifer lawrence and javier bardem play this couple that live in this kind of secluded house and they have unwanted guests that arrive and that's all i'm gonna leave it at is that a so are we not gonna spoil anything about this movie Mm, i feel like it's gonna be hard for us to talk about it if we don't spoil it well, let's, sure let's, 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 let's. I feel let's, like it's impossible. Let's start. Basically. Let's start very kind of non-spoilery, and then we can hit a we can hit our spoiler button and get into it. But uh, yeah, let's Jessica. Let's start with you. What were your thoughts on Mother? Well, it's important to note that it is Mother exclamation point lowercase m lowercase m exclamation point. That's super specific. I love all the gifts on Twitter of like pe- people's speculation of what Aronofsky's re- Aronofsky's re- uh, reaction was when he wrote down the uh, the title for the first time. Just just Google that Aronofsky writing the title for Mother. You'll you'll find some good stuff. <laughs> yep, yep. It's kind of hard not to. <laughs> Okay, so, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about the movie since I saw it last week, and it hasn't really been about me thinking about what the movie means, because I think that if you get the main allegory, then it's pretty easy to connect the pieces. But, like, for me, I've been trying to figure out what Aronofsky's intention behind the film is, and... Uh, I don't if I like it. Like, I've been thinking about this movie, and I'm just not sure he has good intentions. So, like, Jennifer Lawrence said in an interview, she said, there's a point to the film, there's a point to the horrifying images, we aren't just doing it to make you feel terrible. But, like, after I watched the movie, I did feel terrible, and I legit think that he wants you to feel bad. And he said in an interview that he poured all of his anger and rage into the script when he wrote it in five days. And I think that after you watch the movie, you can feel the anger. Um, and that's all I've got to say without spoiling anything. Okay. Uh, Andrew, what about you? I do think that there is a certain sense of provocation in Aronofsky's movies. I've only seen two of them, uh, Black Swan and this. But I know a little bit about... Requiem for a Dream and a couple of his other films. And it does seem like he wants to be in this rank of directors that might include like Gaspar Noe and Lars von Trier and Michael Haneke, like people who are intentionally being hostile to their audiences and and trying to get a, a you know, an aggressive reaction out of them. But I was not as angered and upset by the movie as you were, Jessica. I'm, I'm kind of torn on it, honestly. Uh, I really appreciate how unique it is. It is a super ambitious movie. It is a movie that invites you to take a deeper look at it. And this is a movie that's being released on 2,000 screens by Paramount. Uh, and so it is a much more, you know, interesting artistic movie, uh, artistically interesting movie than 90% of the stuff that is being 
put out by those major studios. But I, I think that even though it invites you to take a deeper look at the allegory, when you do, it doesn't necessarily reward that deep dive that you're taking because once you come to the, you know, the two or three readily accept- available interpretations for this movie, they end up taking you to a, a reductive place where this means this and this means this in the movie and that's kind of all. Um, my The main thing that has occupied space in my brain about Mother, though, since seeing it, is just how exhausting the critical discourse is about this movie. Um, it's it's just way too much. I mean, I was exhausted from the minute the credits started rolling because people in our theater, Jessica and I watched it together, people in our theater just start loudly whining about how confusing the movie is and how brutal the movie is. Yeah, there was a woman who was like literally just going around to strangers asking, do you know what that movie meant? Do you know what that movie meant? And I kind of wanted to just tell her because you can you can explain what the movie means in three words if you if you really want to. Um, but I, I didn't want to have the conversation. Uh, so that's that's. Yeah. Right. And. I think that if you figure out what the movie is about in the first hour, um, you will be fine in the second hour. And if you don't figure out what the movie means before the second hour rolls around, good luck. Because the movie is just incredibly uh, uh, panic-inducing. It's very uh, aggressive. It's very uh, just anxiety-inducing. People have compared uh, it to Antichrist and Sallow and a Serbian film, not because of the violence of those movies being present here, but just because of that general sense of panic. And so if you don't know what's going on, this movie gets very weird and and surreal and abstract, and you kind of have to be tracking it as allegory for anything on screen to actually make sense to you. And so I understand... You know, general theater goers are just going to a night out on Friday. Uh, they've not really necessarily been brought up, uh, told to examine these kinds of movies that they go to see on Friday night with a, a critical, analytical eye. They're not, they're not taught in English class to analyze movies the same way they analyze books. I can totally see why they would be frustrated by a movie like this that just absolutely demands that you interpret it while you're watching it. Otherwise, it has nothing for you. Um, But on the other end of the spectrum, not just audiences being angry about this movie, it feels like critics are universally angry about this movie, too. I mean, there's just a lot of loud whining about this movie being too simplistic, which I can agree with, um, or the movie being too exploitative. Uh, A couple critics that stuck out to me uh, in this camp Rex Reed came out of retirement uh, to call this movie the worst movie of the century, and he he literally called it, uh, quote, pretentious twaddle, uh, to refer back to last week's episode. Uh, I was listening to the Film Stage podcast where Michael Snydell actually hung up on his fellow panelists in the middle of the podcast because he couldn't stand talking about the movie anymore. Uh, And then there's this feminist film journal called Another Gaze that called it on Twitter uh, the most misogynistic piece of bullshit I've ever seen. Uh, And, you know, people who listen to this podcast know that I approach movies from a feminist perspective most of the time. And that take does not make sense to me uh, because if you think about this film as an allegory, Jennifer Lawrence is not playing a woman. She is playing this larger allegorical concept. And so the abuse that is put upon her is not really you're not really supposed to interpret it as like this is what men do to women it's it's about something else that maybe we can talk about after spoilers um but yeah i just i'm just very tired of people talking about this movie i think that there are exactly four good pieces of criticism about this thing uh, out there uh, two of them are on our website by Paige taylor and courtney anderson uh neither of those essays take the traditional or the, the typical angle that people are being are looking at this movie consistently with. Um, There's a piece from Brian Rowan at the film stage talking about how explainer culture is bullshit and how the response to this movie proves that. Uh, And then one that I want to encourage people to check out is a piece by Jen Yamato for the LA Times. Uh, She has a conversation with um, Justin Chang, who's another LA film critic, and they have a a super level-headed Discussion uh, where Justin Chang makes the point that this movie is one of the few major studio releases this year that is of actual interest, uh, and I agree with him. Because even if this film is not perfect or not as profound as Aronofsky thinks it is, 
it is maybe the first like truly surprising studio film this year that has generated so much discussion. I just wish the discussion was less angry and toxic. <laughs> Uh, Zach, what do you think? Sure. I, I agree um, with, I guess, Justin Chang's point that I, I wasn't a giant fan of this movie, but I do, I'm like, I'm glad that it was a movie released by Paramount. Um, and they had a quote where they said, you know, everybody celebrates Netflix when they tell a story no one wants to tell, but, you know, they get backlash when they put this uh, movie out. I'm like, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's fair. Um, I guess Netflix just gets to hide it under its, you know, thousands of other things of content while you know mother is in a theater that people are paying for but regardless i understand their their point um yeah i wasn't a giant i think that i don't know maybe i sound like nathan here (laughs) this is one of those and and this is kind of the i feel like with most of darren aronofsky's films outside of black swan which i really do like um i've the other the only other one i've seen i've seen i believe i've seen pie i can't it's been a while though, so I don't. I'm not super clear on it. And I've seen Requiem for a Dream, and he, I don't know, he's just one of those directors that is very. He 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 just feels in his movies like he's so proud of how profound he is and how he like. It's like that that the the brain meme where it has the three brains that are getting bigger, and he and he felt like he was like. He, he came out of the womb on that third final brain, but he's like even eclipsing that. And I'm sure he's, I don't know, maybe, I'm sh- maybe he's a nice guy. He doesn't seem like he's a nice guy. I don't really know. Um, but he, he, he just this movie, the movie is, it feels very proud of itself at times. And um, I think Nathan has said this before, but it's, it, 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 or at least that may be on his Twitter or something, but it's, it's kind of, it's, that's almost a frustrating quality because, um, I don't know, you, you don't really want to be watching something, whether it's a movie or anything that, that seems to be like, you know, kind of dragging you along with its own prerogative you kind of you want it you you'd rather the movie just kind of lead the way rather than drag you and this one seems to be kind of dragging you a lot of, and that's and honestly that's kind of what it seems like it's doing the jennifer lawrence at times where it's just dragging her around so I, I i get that that's the point i just didn't i didn't respond to it as much i'd like to say before we jump into the spoiler thing part though my the part that made me laugh really really hard was it the part kind of midway through when they're having a wake and there's all these people in the house and Jennifer Lawrence is like running around going, you know, what, who are all these people? And these, this couple is sitting on this sink and she's like, don't sit on the sink. It's not braced yet. And they get off and then they get back on. She's like, please don't sit on the sink. And they're like, it's fine. (laughs) And they're like jumping up and down on, they're like, it's fine. That's okay. And then the sink of course breaks. And that made me laugh really hard because who like, like who has to prove that the sink's okay by jumping up and down on it? That's not a normal reaction. Again, again this is not a, a movie that features normal reactions, but I just found that wildly entertaining. They're like, it's okay, as they're like beating like it, it to death. It was it, that 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 just cracked me up. Um, but let's go ahead and get into spoiler uh, talk. We have a few more minutes left. Um, what did you guys want to get off your chest? So Jessica, you had an issue with the allegorical message of this movie. So do you want to just kind of lay out what what it is actually about and why that bothered you? It's the Bible. <laughs> That's all you got to say. Just those three words. It's the Bible. The Bible. <laughs> no. Okay. So, I mean, the, the house represents Earth and Javier Bardem is God. And Jennifer Lawrence is Mother Earth slash Mary, which is the part that gets really confusing because if you're following the Bible allegory, then towards the end of the movie, she gets pregnant and then she gives birth to a baby, which is sacrificed, um, which is a really terrible part in the movie, but... So then if you follow that, then she is Mary. But if you follow kind of the environmentalist kind of view on the movie, then she's Mother Earth and her and the home are one and invading her home. They're kind of taking advantage and polluting. Um, So I guess those are like the the main kind of themes in it. But with the Bible allegory, I mean, that's the one that I think 
people, once they recognize it, I mean, it's pretty hard to deny that that's what it's about because you have a guy who shows up played Ed Harris. And I mean, he's pretty much Adam. And then they extract his, they get to talking, they extract his rib. I mean, he gets really sick and then the bathroom door opens and you see a scar on his back. So you're like, okay, which you did. That doesn't click for you until the end, whenever you start putting together that he's Adam. And then Michelle Pfeiffer is Eve. She all of a sudden shows up and then um, they go. Eve basically like tempts Adam to go into the study and to touch people. And then they go off to have sex or whatever, which is (laughs) a really weird part in the movie. And then all of a sudden, yeah. Can I pull, can I point out though that like, some great Michelle Pfeiffer action in this movie. Like she was fantastic. I I loved her. We need more Michelle Pfeiffer in our lives. Oh yeah, she's really good. I think that just a, a home invasion movie of like fucking Michelle Pfeiffer is in my house won't leave me alone would be an equally good yeah. if anyway, not better continue. genre film. <laughs> right. And, and then you have my boy Domo Gleason. He shows up <laughs> with, with his brother. Like, which with his brother, his actual brother in real life, shout out to the Gleason brothers, which was the best part in this movie for me. And I actually, while I was watching it, was like, yes, that is Domo Gleason, because I was very surprised. But anyways, Domo Gleason kills his brother. So it's like Cain killing Abel. And then um, Domo Gleason flees into the wilderness and they have a big, you know, funeral for his brother after he gets killed and then what happens after that andrew then there's a yeah, there's, then a, there's flood. a flood there's a flood as there is in genesis there's a flood it's i mean those we don't have jump to go through the, the whole thing but because they break the sink <laughs> as zach said earlier so we could actually spend probably 15 20 minutes just yeah, outlining we, we every single detail the whole and bible. how it correlates yeah. to the bible but you know, obviously it does. So what was what was your issue with that, Jessica? Okay, so my whole issue with that is I I think that if you're going to do like a Bible allegory specifically having to do with Christianity, like I think that that's fine, but for me, like I felt like Aronofsky's tone was very condescending. And the reason I say that is because, and Andrew has pointed this out to me when I was talking to him about it, but like Javier Bardem as God is a very complex character sexy. because, I mean, you, and, <laughs> sexy God. And, <laughs> it's like a, the sexy, have a sexy movie God. From last year. <laughs> In in one sense, have him, you know, being forgiving, like telling Jennifer Lawrence that even after these humans have eaten her baby, like telling her, like, you need to forgive them. They, you know, you need to forgive them. You need to be forgiving. We need to love everybody. We need to open up the world to everyone, which is like, okay, I understand it. But then you have his character that is like acting like you know fame has gotten to him like he's like no no, like I need to sign these to take these peak pictures these people love me they love my art they love my poetry and it is kind of like you know God as artist like it's saying that he's the most important person and towards the end he tells her you need to give me everything and she gives up her heart. Mother Earth gives up her heart to God. And it just paints this very strange. And I, making, you know, her have a baby and then sacrificing that baby and all of the people. And these people are supposed to represent represent humanity. And then having them just eat the baby is... It's just so gross and disturbing, and it just paints this really disgusting portrait of human. And I, I 
didn't like it. And I understand if his point was, you know, because him and Jennifer Lawrence have teamed up with this movie and they're saying, like, we have a message. We have this big message about how we're abusing the environment, like we're abusing Mother Earth. And it's like how like you're making everyone feel terrible. Like if that's your intent, then good. Like you did you achieved that because people feel awful when they watch this movie. So that's, that's my whole thing. Yeah. Andrew, do you have any other spoiler things before, because we're going to wrap up now? Um, I mean, to briefly comment on Jessica's point, I feel like if the movie portrays humanity in a very negative light, I think that the Bible portrays humanity in a pretty negative light. I mean, by most accounts and most interpretations of the Bible, it is portraying humans as inherently sinful who continually uh, uh, mess up and uh, go back on the promises they make to God and need to be punished and then given further uh, um, opportunities to do right and and then fail in those further opportunities. The movie presents that. I mean, the movie is presenting a literal look at the Bible. It is showing you what the the narrative of the Bible would feel like if it was played out by actual human beings as opposed to being this abstract mythology on a page. Um, And if it upsets, I feel, and I'm not trying to put anything on you, Jessica, that it's possibly just because we are not used to thinking about the Bible in a, a more realistic human drama kind of way. Um, and I, I, I don't think it's necessarily un, unreligious or unchristian to portray God or humanity the way that Aronofsky does here. Not that he necessarily has an obligation to be pro-religious or pro-Christian, but I do think he surprisingly comes across as fairly faithful to the source material that he's drawing from. So faithful, in my opinion, that the movie becomes a little uninteresting after you figure out what it is uh, making being an allegory for, because there's not much else under the surface except what is already under the surface of the Bible, and like he doesn't necessarily add much to it in in my uh, view. All right, um, <sighs> that's all I got. All right, well, like I think we're we're running on time, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and wrap it up. Uh, Mother, it's in theaters now. I feel like if you want to have a weird experience, you should go see it. And hopefully there's people in the theater with you because I think that's it needs to be experienced with with complete strangers who have no idea what's going on. I had a lady two rows in front of me who just said, who just kept uh, audibly kind of like, so, not, not really loudly, but just softly going, what the fuck? What the fuck? What? What the fuck? what the fuck <laughs> like she kept doing, and then at the end she was just like i don't know and then like walked out of the theater i don't i don't know if she didn't like it or she like I don't, i'm not sure i should have i should have asked her afterwards but uh yeah that's in theaters now i guess so uh, all right well, wrap up part one we're gonna take a short break uh we will be back talking tiff after this Hi there, Cinematary listeners. This is your favorite Filipino podcaster, Jessica Carr, with an important message during this break in the show. Cinematary would like you to know that we surprisingly do not want your money, and we don't want to place ads in the show at this time. That's not why we do this. We do it because we enjoy each other's company, and we want to bring you our pure, unadulterated opinions on the world of cinema. However, there are a few things you can do to help out the show that we would greatly appreciate. Firstly, leave us a review on iTunes, preferably a positive one, because apparently this will help increase our podcast exposure. Secondly, send us a tweet at Cinematary, or better yet, send us an email at cinematary at yahoo.com so we can hear from you guys for a change. Maybe you can tell us where the money from Fargo is stashed, or maybe you don't think In the Mood for Love is the sexiest movie you've ever seen. Regardless, let us know your thoughts, and we will read them out and respond to them on future episodes. Finally, please share the show with friends and members of your family who you think really enjoy listening to us and participating in our film discussions. We also have some cool merchandise that you can check out on the site. So to recap, review, send us your thoughts through Twitter and email, and share with your friends and family. We would truly appreciate it. Thank you for listening, and now back to the show. And 
we are back with part two of episode 162 of Cinematary. In this part, we will be continuing nothing. We're going to be talking about. T- <laughs> I got real. I got into. I got into the young critics thing. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Toronto International Film Festival with Darren Hughes. Uh, Darren attended the festival for his 14th year, so he is. Uh, I guess he's going to be our expert now. Uh, Darren, let's talk real before we get into like the movies that you saw and, and were, were the ones that you really enjoyed. Let's let's talk about the festival kind of at large. What was uh, first your experience at this year's festival and kind of what has been what has Toronto been for you the last, you know, 13 years, I guess. Um, yeah. So I, the, the first time I went was in 2004. Um, and it, which was like pre social media days, which I only mentioned because, um, the, the reason I went in 2004 was those were like the high, the high days of film blogging and, uh, a couple film blogger friends and I, you know, we would, um, we would communicate constantly through email and through comments on each other's websites and stuff. And, and we all decided to get together one year, uh, in Toronto because, um, I think it's still the case, maybe a little less so now than it was in 2004, but Toronto has always had like a very, um, it's always been very open to the public. It's always had like this democratic spirit where like basically if you can, if you're willing to buy the tickets, you can see almost anything you want. Um, uh, in all the years I've been going, the, um, I think some of the price structuring has changed a bit and there's. Um, I think the festival has, has experienced some growing pains during that time, but still, you know, I'd recommend it to you all. I'd recommend it to your, to, uh, cemetery listeners. If you're a, if you're a film buff and you've never been to a festival, um, you know, Toronto allows basically anybody to, um, like pre book, you know, you can buy, uh, ticket packages. You can, um, order all of your tickets before you leave and, um, the, 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 especially now the, um, sort of the, the geography of the festival has, has gotten much smaller in the past five or six years. And so it's, it's actually really pretty easy if you have the stamina and you want to, to watch, uh, five films a day. Um, so that's, that's always been my main reason for going is, uh, since I don't go to Cannes or Berlin or Locarno or, um, any of the, the other major European festivals, um, TIFF generally speaking, um, brings in most of the most important titles from those festivals. And then also is a, is a launching point for, um, for sort of new premieres in the fall. And so, um, yeah. Well, I, I was going to just real quickly. Um, it seemed like this year it wasn't as much a launching point because I know a lot of the the big releases, I, you know, I don't I don't know if you saw them, but, you know, the you know, like the shape of water and a couple of the, you know, these kind of big name, the you know, big movies that people are going to be looking for for the end of the year. Uh, it seemed like they were at you know, Venice or Berlin or Cannes. And then it seemed like Toronto didn't have as many. This was the first time people were seeing this movie as they've had in the past. But I don't know, maybe that's just an outsider perspective that's wrong. Well, I mean, Toronto is in a weird place on the calendar because it, it starts a week after Venice. And so a lot of, um, especially European filmmakers, will do their premieres there and then and then bring them immediately um, to Toronto. Uh, and then sort of sandwiched in between there is the Telluride Film Festival, which um, the lineup for Telluride is always basically kept secret until it starts. Um, it's kind of one of the nerdy film things to do, um, like when TIFF usually announces their full calendar, um, maybe five weeks before the festival starts. And so you could go and, and so, for example, like Paul Schrader's new film, First Reformed, was announced as a Canadian premiere. I think I'm getting that right. And so you could then do the math and work backwards and go, OK, so it's definitely playing in Venice and in Telluride because it'll it'll play both uh, Europe and the States before it opens in Canada. Um, and uh, so. So, yeah, I mean. As launching point, Toronto has kind of made its reputation over the past five years for um, releasing like prestige American films. They have um, 
the, they offer some awards, but they're not like as as prominent as like the Palm d'Or and Can or whatever. But they have a um, they have an audience prize, and I don't know what the exact statistics are, but it seems like maybe five of the past six years or something like that, the audience prize winner has then gone on to either win or or be very much in the running for for the best picture Oscar. Um, this year it was, uh, I can never remember the whole title, but it's three billboards. Oh yeah. Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Oh yeah. The, the Martin McDonough. Yeah. Movie. Yeah. So, so that's the one that won the, won the audience prize. And so it has become that kind of, of launching point. Yeah. Um, well, let's go ahead and get into some of the movies that you watched. Um, I have a list of a few that I wanted to kind of, you know, these were kind of some of the bigger name releases and then we can talk about some that um that you really enjoy that i I didn't mention the first one i think is is one that we'll be talking a lot about and at the end of the year and the beginning of next year and oscar season that's call me by your name uh it's the latest from luca guadagnino uh it stars army hammer and timothy chalamet uh what were your impressions of that movie what you know do you think that this is one that you know will be one of those oscar potential movies yeah, maybe. Um, I mean, I'm not very good at speculating on Oscar potential, um, but but uh, you know, I missed his I missed his last film, but but really kind of enjoyed the um, sort of the how do you describe I Am Love? Like the the just the exuberance of the filmmaking in that one. Um, Call Me by Your Name uh, is is a little more low key than that. Um, I, I was really, it, I, I won't spoil it at all, but it, it ends with this amazing monologue by one of the more minor characters. Um, and it's one of these scenes that, um, like shouldn't work, but it totally wrecked me. Um, and, and like it, it, it I was so affected by that scene that it kind of made me reevaluate my, my whole relationship with the film. Um, so just as a quick summary, it's about, um, there's a, there's an American, um, I guess he's an anthropologist working in Europe and every summer he, he, um, he brings in a new graduate student to help him. And so this, the film starts as army hammer arrives as a supposedly 24 year old graduate student. And, um, the son of the professor, um, and Army Hammer begin sort of flirting with, with each other and they have this relationship. And it's, uh, you know, um, I, I, I do my best to not um, read any spoilers or, or even um, usually even any plot description before I go into a film. And so I didn't realize that um, the film was written by, um, is it James Ivory, I believe? Um you know, of, of Merchant Ivory. And it's, and, and so it's a very, um, classically written film, sort of overwritten film. And, um, Army Hammer is a very odd presence in the film. He's kind of, I was telling people afterwards that he was kind of like the, the rock Hudson of our generation. Like he's not necessarily the best actor, but he's just so, I mean, he's just such a presence, like such a, um, like beautiful man. That's kind of his function in the film. Um, and so just in talking to friends and other critics afterwards, it seems like the divide, the critical divide is, um, is based on how much people are, um, willing to buy army hammer in the role. Um, I've also talked to some friends who are like, who are, um, uh, gay men and, um, They've had wildly different responses. One one friend really loved the film and said that told me that he knows that he loved the film so much because it kind of reflected his own life. Um, and another uh, critic has has basically said that he has the same problem with this film that he has a lot of sort of gay films um, featuring heterosexual um, actors, which is the sex scenes never quite work for him because. You can't like the the actors themselves don't seem to be delighting in each other in the same way that that gay actors might. Um, so so it's a I mean, I, I certainly recommend the film. Um, definitely well worth seeing. Yeah. 
Um, the next one I was curious about was the directorial debut of Greta Gerwig, and that is Lady Bird. Uh, I think I believe uh, Saoirse, Saoirse Ronan stars in that. It has Laurie Metcalf and Tracy Letts, which is already just a powerhouse three. Uh, but what were your impressions of that one, especially as Gerwig, you know, moving to the director's chair? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I can, um, like, after seeing this, make any comments about her uh you know, authorial voice as a, as a filmmaker. Uh, but I enjoyed the hell out of the film. Um, I really did. I mean, uh, Saoirse Ronan, as far as I can tell is playing Greta Gerwig in the film. Um, it's about, uh, you know, her last year of high school, she's, a um, the younger child in a working class family that is kind of struggling to figure out how to pay, uh, for her college. Um, but just really, really delightful, like super well, well written and funny and charming and um, sort of unapologetic about being a, uh, you know, teen movie in the John Hughes mold. Um, I really enjoyed it. Now, uh, Darren, I know that you uh, did not see Edge of Seventeen last year, but one thing that um, critics are, are currently turning me off from this movie by saying is that this is a better version of Edge of Seventeen, which I'm like, there is no such thing as a better version of Edge of Seventeen. Um, do, did you talk to anybody up there who, who made that comparison? Um, I saw it with my friend Girish, um, who's been on Cinematary, and uh, Girish yeah. loves friend of the podcast. Yeah, Girish loves teen movies. It's like a deep love of his. And um, I remember he, he he I think he mentioned Edge of Seventeen on the way out, but I don't know that he made a, any sort of comparison about okay. which which he preferred or anything. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, the next one I wanted to ask about, and this one I'm very curious to hear what you have to say because um we haven't really got much information about it but it's definitely a controversial uh topic and that is i love you daddy which is the kind of secret (laughs) film made by louis ck um but yeah i'm gonna i'll I'll let you kind of dive into that one to tell us about it yeah do you do you want me to talk about what it what it's about (laughs) yeah yeah i guess that's a good way of kind of explaining why it's kind of controversial (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so so it's uh, Louis plays um, basically a TV producer who uh, it, it, near the beginning of the film you found out you find out that um, he's divorced with a with a daughter who's a senior in high school, and um, he has just sold another TV show. So he is um, and and uh, the show that he already has on air has made him fabulously wealthy, and. Um, so the film is basically about his relationship with his daughter, who is uh, spoiled rotten. And um, Louis's character has uh, – he's, he's sort of making his living um, as a comedy writer but uh, kind of hates himself because he really aspires to be a great filmmaker in the mold of um, – I can't remember the character's name, but he's played by John Malkovich and he's kind of like um, – I don't know, like a Stanley Kubrick type figure in his life, you know, like, uh, um, the, the, the great cinema artist of his generation. I've seen people, um, make the equivalence of John Malkovich as Woody Allen. Is, is that something that came across your mind? It seem it seems more like, like Louis CK's Woody oh, okay. Allen, judging from that description. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's like, uh, I, I thought of, um, Stanley Kubrick, because uh, the the character clearly is supposed to be a great, serious, dramatic filmmaker. Okay. Um, But the comparisons to Woody Allen are is that that this guy is basically a a known pervert. Like he he uh, he has throughout his entire life sort of um, flitted from one teenage uh, lover to the next. And um, I love you, daddy. Sort of the central tension in the film is that John Malkovich's character meets uh, Louis C.K.'s daughter and uh, begins a relationship with her. And um, so like, it, yeah, I mean, it's it's clearly inspired by Woody Allen and maybe maybe others. But um, I think what I think what sort of makes the film more controversial and which kind of dampened my enthusiasm for it is um 
I don't know, Louis, Louis's character, John Malkovich's character, and um, a few other characters are just sort of unapologetically um, like horny is the only word that's coming to mind. Like they're they're um, a bit misogynist, and and Louis, the director writer, I think is enjoying kind of the tension of having it both ways, you know? So like clearly all these guys are assholes, but they're also funny and charming. And I think he, um, see Louis is, is enjoying that tension that it's creating, but just to be blunt, like it made me really uncomfortable at times. Um, and it's, it's, it's definitely funny, but I felt, um, I don't know. I didn't enjoy the laughs. Did you go in aware of the uh, allegations against Louis C.K.? I did. I did. Yeah. Yeah. And and I mean that definitely colored it too. I'm glad you asked that because you know he's he's basically been accused of of like masturbating in front of um, women, sort of against their will. And there's a character in the film who like pretends to masturbate while. Uh, Louis's character is on the phone with with an actress and it's whether that's coincidence or not like whether he knew that that was going to be news when the film was released the the scene is just kind of I mean other people were laughing it just felt gross to me um and so it yeah yeah I I, I I'm still you know as as a fan of Louis CK's you know his show and his, and his you know co- comedic work I'm, I'm curious to see what he c- can do you know with a with a feature film but yeah it seems like a lot of the um it seems like there's a lot of baggage with with watching I love you daddy yeah the and, title, and it's the title doesn't help. I think Horace and Pete was like one of one of you know speaking of the conversation about what is film and what is tv um I, Horace and Pete was one of my favorite whatevers of the past <laughs> three or four years. And Maybe so, we need a best whatever list at the end. There you of the go. Yeah. But I had very high hopes for it and was just a little frustrated. Yeah. Um, the next one on the one that I wanted to ask you about was Ex Libris, which you ranked as your number one film of the festival uh i've heard i've heard stuff uh from other film critics kind of you know talking on twitter about that i guess can you first explain what the movie is and what kind of struck you about it since it's you know number one yeah so it's the latest film by frederick wiseman who um i think is america's maybe maybe cinema's greatest documentarian um he has spent the last uh 50 years. Can't remember when Teddy cut follies came out 62, something like that. He spent basically the last 50 plus years making one documentary after another. And basically the subject of his life has been the great institutions that, um, that, uh, that we all enjoy in our lives. And so it's everything from, you know, he's made films about, um, state legislatures to, um, uh, you know, dance troops to, um, uh, public universities and, um, Ex Libris, his latest film is a three and a half hour documentary about the New York public library system. And, uh, <clears throat> so I kind of assumed, I don't know why I, I thought this when I sat down for it, but I thought it was mostly just like my image of the New York public library is that, um, you know, the main building in midtown Manhattan and, um, but over the three course of three and a half hours, you know, he spends a lot of time there, but he also goes to the smaller branches in, in some of the other boroughs. And, and so you see just this um, sort of the way this public institution affects lives throughout the city, which, um, you know, given the state of, of our country right now, uh, part of my love of the film just came down to like how inspiring it was to see, um, just to see the good that comes from this kind of collective, um, public effort. Yeah. Um, I felt the same way about step just a couple weeks ago. What is that? I felt the same way about a uh, step, the documentary about the, um, step team in the Baltimore inner city school. Oh, cool. I haven't seen that. I think you would like it. 
I hope you yeah. realize. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I mean, the, I think another reason that I'm just like in the bag for this kind of movie, it's the same reason I really loved um, Wiseman's film at Berkeley is that in my day job, basically I work for the University of Tennessee, but my job is to help um, basically help raise money for the university. And so I spend a lot of time in meetings that uh, from an outside perspective would probably seem pretty boring. You know, um, you know, we're talking about long-term planning and strategic planning and measurable objectives and all this kind of stuff. But the, the fact is that like, that's what's necessary in order to make a bureaucracy move and in order for it to do good work. And so, um, a couple of the central characters in Ex Libris are, are just the, the leaders of the public library system and, and just getting to see how they're constantly balancing the responsibilities of, you know, do you do you invest limited resources in uh, making more bestsellers available as electronic downloads, or do you spend that money on special collections so that the, the so that those letters? There's a scene where um, a researcher is looking at letters between W. B. Yeats and James Joyce, and it's like, you know, where where is the best investment of our resources, and how do we how do we present the mission of the library to the new mayor of New York so that he realizes that we are worthy of, you know, state, uh, investment and those sorts of, sorts of things. It's, a, um, it's, it's, a. I was inspired by it. It made me cry several times, just seeing good people doing good work. Hmm. It sounds like something that, uh, you know, Lydia would enjoy. I feel like that kind of that kind of behind the scenes work with you know yeah. saving important yeah, pieces of, of of culture. Um, the 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 last one I wanted to ask you about was uh, First Reformed, which I've seen a lot of buzz about. It seems to have really kind of blindsided people with how much they liked it, um, and you ranked it pretty high on your list as well. Yeah, First Reformed is the latest film by Paul Schrader, who's probably best remembered for writing Taxi Driver. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with his work. I'd, I'd kind of given up on Schrader, I think at some point, um, I hadn't been much interested in him. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, he, this film played at, uh, <coughs> Telluride, which is usually, a, a some kind of sign of quality. And so I'd put it on my list to see, and then the reviews out of Venice were so strong, um, I went to see it and I went to the second press screen and my friend, um, Keith Ulick saw the first screening and just came out just glowing. He was, he was like, this is, this is the film of the festival. And, and, um, and so I was really eager to see it and I was really relieved that it totally lived up to my expectations. Um, I don't know if you all know much about Schrader, but he wrote this book, uh, I think it was in the late seventies called the transcendental style in cinema. And it was, and he was basically yeah. making, sorry. Uh, it's, it's the one on, on, uh, is it Bregman, uh, or Bresson, Ozu, and I forgot the third person. It's, it's about it's, three directors. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, Bresson, Bergman, Ozu, um, Dreyer and Tarkovsky. I think, uh, uh, I mean, he, he, yeah, basically the, the canon of spiritual filmmakers. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think I read that he's working on an updated version of it, which doesn't surprise me because First Reformed um, is just like a checklist of um, memes like from the great uh, <laughs> from the great spiritual filmmakers. So like Ethan Hawke plays a, um, a pastor in a in a small um centuries old church. And at the beginning of it, he starts writing a diary. And so everybody immediately thinks of diary of a country priest by Brisson. Um, and then, uh, the church is framed and looks exactly like the church in Bergman's, uh, winter lights. And, uh, there's a bicycle scene that's straight out of Ozu and there's a floating body scene straight out of Tarkovsky. And, um, but man, it's just, a, it's just like, it's just exciting filmmaking um, with a really tight script. There's a, there's a scene, I won't spoil anything, but there's a great scene early on 
between um, Ethan Hawke's priest and a young man who's been attending his church. And it's one of those scenes where you realize about a minute in that this conversation is going to last a little while and it's going to surprise you. Um, and uh, immediately after the film, I went out for a long lunch with a friend of mine from Toronto and she and I just talked. I swear we talked for like an hour just about this conversation between these two characters. Um, yeah, super exciting film. How is uh, Amanda Seyfried in the movie? Uh, I've recently become a bit of a fan of hers after watching Jennifer's Body, and she was amazing in Twin Peaks this summer. So um, how is she? She's great. Um, she has a very central role. Um, I don't I don't know how much actual screen time she gets, maybe only 20 minutes, 20 or 30 minutes. But um, she's a, she gives this really... Uh, natural performance, which is, which is welcomed in this film because it is kind of elevated. The form of the film is elevated. And I think, I think Ethan Hawke is very intentionally um, playing down some of his persona. I mean, he, he sort of acts like the priests and, and pastors and Bressons and Bergman's films. And so every time she comes on, it's like this very human, um, presence in the film she's great nice and uh we have about you know four or five minutes left i wanted to give you uh some time real quickly to kind of go over some some of the movies that you really enjoyed that we that we you know didn't mention um sure yeah i just actually uh ranked all uh all the feature films on on letterbox so i'll, I'll run through them real quick like um zama is the new film by uh the argentinian filmmaker lucrecia martel um, Martel is, I think, uh, one of the world's great filmmakers and she's been on the sidelines for the past nine years because of some, um, some projects that, that never got made. Um, this is a, a film based on a famous Argentinian novel that is set kind of in the colonial era. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting film. I'm thrilled, um, I'm thrilled she's back and, and making films again. Um, my friend Danny Kasman and I did a, a really long interview with her um, in Toronto that you can read at uh, movie.com's notebook. Um, she's a great thinker and a great artist. Um, I'll also want to mention a film called Three Quarters. And uh, basically my favorite experience now as um, – a cinephile is sitting down to watch a movie by a filmmaker I've never heard of and knowing almost immediately that I can just trust this person, um, to lead me wherever he wants to go. And so three quarters is the first narrative feature by Ilian Metev. I think I pronounced that correctly. Um, the film is from Bulgaria and it's basically about, um, this family, um, a father, uh, daughter and son during the summer before the daughter leaves college for college. And it, and so it's just kind of like the family trying to make sense of what they're going to look like after she leaves. Um, but Medev is a, is a really precise controlled filmmaker and there's, and he builds in not dramatic tension, but like formal tension it's a weird comparison, but it actually reminds me of like uh, uh, one of those one of those uh, good um, Michael Hanukkah films where you just feel a tension in the framing, uh, uh, the frame itself. Um, <clears throat> and then a quick shout out to uh, uh, Agnes Varda, who's um, I think I put this on Twitter or Facebook the other day, but like I think I actually love Agnes Varda. Like I, I, what I like what I feel for her is it's like it's beyond just like respect. I think it's actual love. And um, <laughs> this uh, this will likely be her last film. Um, and it's a it's a documentary about this. She she met um, a young photographer named J.R. And um, basically they just travel around the French countryside photographing people and, and doing these art installations. Um, if you've ever seen her film, the gleaners and I, 
which is, I think, one of the greatest films of all time. This is this plays almost like a, a sequel to that. Just a just a, a a film that like makes you feel good about humanity again. OK. Um, all right. Well, Darren, thank you so much for coming on and uh, and talking with us. It's kind of, you know, I don't know. I would love to go to Toronto. I feel I feel like it's it's a trek that needs to happen. We should have a cinematary cinematary trek to Toronto. Hey. Um, you totally I should. Did. Yeah. I mean, the, the other fun thing about it is like uh, I always joke that it's like movie nerd summer camp. It's like film Twitter um, just appears <laughs> in Toronto. And, and see, um, I don't know if I want film Twitter to appear. That's true. I, I don't either. Part, stay distant. <laughs> no, for the most part, it's really great. For the most part, it's really great. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, that will wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary, on Twitter at handle at cinematary, and on Letterbox at letterbox.com slash cinematary, where we post all of the movies that we discussed in this episode, including the ones that Darren talked about from TIFF. Uh, next week, we will be kicking off our October Horror series a little early. Um, what is the movie? Still the undecided movie? on... Well, we're, 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 we're still... It might we have we have a, a schedule in place that will be on the website on Saturday, um, but this this next week it might be the start of the schedule that we have or it might be something else um, that's still up in the air. Uh, but mm. we will be starting the October suspense. It's not that suspenseful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, but we will be starting our October horror horror series a little early. We kind of ran out of random stuff to talk about in September, so we're gonna just go, you know have an extra week of horror of or horror mayhem. Recommendations um, for things you want run. us to talk about that are not specific films. Shoot us a tweet. Yeah, definitely. That would be that would be good. If you and if you have any topics or anything that you'd like us to discuss, uh, you know, in the future, we're, we're we're whenever we have like one-off topics, we're always struggling for what we should do. Um, so if you if you guys have something that you're like, yeah, we'd like you you know to talk about this, that's kind of an evergreen thing. Uh, please send it our way, and we'll save it in the bank. Um, but until then, thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.